to this webcast lecture about the year 1848, the so-called Year of Revolutions, or Springtime of Nations, when a series of political revolutions across the continent of Europe rocked the foundations of the reactionary empires that had triumphed over Napoleon in the name of the Holy Alliance, and which had imposed reactionary regimes on the entire continent of Europe throughout the 1820s and 1830s and most of the 1840s. Now, without giving the story away entirely, these revolutions were to end in political failure. These failed revolutions were marked by nationalism and liberalism. It was the nationalism of the smaller ethno-linguistic groups, for example, the Czechs and the Italians and the Irish, against the larger multinational empires such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the uh, Prussian Empire and the Russian Empire. Ultimately, these nationalistic movements were to be successful, but we did not see the foundation, for example, of a national state for Poland in anything like its modern form until after the First World War. So that's why it's the springtime of nations. These revolutions were in the main abortive, but they set running the whole movement towards national independence within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire. Russian Empire is slightly different. Dynamics of those slightly different. We'll discuss that. They set that running and also unleash really the movement of socialism uh, because for the first time in 1848 the proletariat, that's to say not simply the poor or the disorganized mob, the people who had carried out the terror during the French Revolution, uh, the various peasants and so on who, who revolted throughout history in a series of kind of romantic uh, peasant revolts, but the organized uh, working class become a factor in politics during the events of 1848 really for the first time and subsequently play a major role in the evolving uh, in the evolving constitutional settlement, constitutional settlement in most major European countries. After 1848, we see the foundation of working class parties and trade unions in almost every country, and they are to become predominant, really, in politics right at the end of the 19th century and really set the agenda for the uh, 20th century. But after 1848, the reactionary powers are triumphant once again and they reimpose very conservative, very reactionary and especially in Russia um, very repressive regimes again. The uh, new force of the working class parties and the middle class liberal parties who are still looking for the kind of constitutional rights that were by this point guaranteed by the American constitution in North America and which had been promulgated during the French Revolution and the ups and downs of um, the French state ever since. Uh, in most of continental Europe, those rights are still not granted by the reactionary monarchies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The emerging Prussian Empire, which is to take after 1848 increasingly the name of the German Empire, and most of all the you know ultra-reactionary um, czarist monarchical regime in Russia, uh, and uh, in most, I mean that that uh, regime also ruled over much of Eastern Europe. It ruled over much of Poland, for example. The the Russian czarist regime it wasn't a pure uh, Russian national entity by any means. Another consequence of the failure of the revolutions in 1848 was a renewed wave of emigration from Europe to the United States. Um, this came from Ireland, it came from Scandinavia, uh, but mostly it came from Germany itself after the crushing of the liberal revolution in 1848, uh, and from the various, from amongst the various nationalities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, such as the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Poles, and also the Italians. So when you go to New York now and you go to Little Italy and then you see a kind of Polish area and a Czech area, all of that has its roots in the mass emigration that was happening after 1848 because these countries became unlivable uh, in many ways for, um, for two reasons. One is the lack of liberal economic reform slowed down 
economic development, especially in Russia and in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and in Italy. So these countries became incredibly poor and therefore net exporters of labour. Secondly, large numbers of liberals and intellectuals were persecuted after the failure of 1848 and they made their way to the United States. So a lot of the incredible intellectual vitality of the United States comes from this emigration of uh, frustrated liberals and um, free thinkers and uh, Jews, it has to be said, because Jews were heavily persecuted uh, in Germany, Russia and austro uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, particularly in Poland, after the 1848 revolution. The reactionaries who came back to power were very often uh, very ultramontane Catholics uh, with, tinged with anti-Semitism and they tended to blame uh, the Jews for the revolutions of 1848 and for the increasing popularity of non-national or anti-national movements such as socialism. So if you think of a man like Joseph Pulitzer, for example, who was absolutely central in creating the idea of the modern newspaper, he was a liberal uh, refugee from the Hungarian Empire at the end, from Hungary, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire at uh, in the years following 1848. Take something as quintessentially American as the hamburger. Uh, it's not called that because it's named after ham, like you have the chicken burgers and all this uh, horrible, horrible junk food. Um, it's called hamburger because it comes from the town of Hamburg, and that recipe was brought by refugees, many of them Jewish, uh, to New York in the decades following 1848. A whole language, in fact, was brought to uh, New York um, Yiddish, which is a, a combination of Hebrew and German, and that has profoundly influenced the accent of New York and the polyglot language in which modern newspaper journalism is conducted. Yet another example is Budweiser beer. That was uh, from Czechoslovakia. It's named after a town. Budweis is the German name for a Czechoslovakian town that would have been under the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Um, the immigrants who made that beer came over in the 1850s and started producing it in the 1860s and 70s. Another very good example of this is a man called Wedemeyer, who was Karl Marx's publisher in Germany in the 1840s. After the 1848 revolution failed in Germany, uh, Marx became an exile uh, eventually in London. He stayed for a short while in Brussels as well, but then in London. But Wedemeyer became an exile in New York and ended up uh, as a general in Abraham Lincoln's uh, Northern Union Army fighting in the Civil War. So you can see how all the politics of, of Europe, really, uh, the tragedy of Europe, if you like, gets transported to North America and one version of that, 1848, in a way, is again fought out during the American Civil War. It's absolutely fascinating. Alongside Wedemeyer and Pulitzer, intellectuals like that, and business people or craftspeople like Budweiser, and whoever it was who invented the hamburger, you also have a lot of labour power coming from Europe, poorer, poorer people, less recognised in a way. And of course, this is the Irish. The Irish uh, nationalists that I know claim that the whole city of New York was physically built by Irish labour, and it's a cliche that the Irish, you know, for a long time ran the politics of New York and uh, staffed its police force, for example. Other nationalities, such as the Russians, uh, were very important in, in cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore, working in the iron and steel industry. The Swedes were there, Norwegians, etc. So you get this mass migration from Europe to the United States. And with those remarks on the significance of 1848, that ends the first part of this multi-part lecture on 1848, the springtime of nations.